if you're watching live at, uh, at home, please send your questions into hashtag pathway to reform and we will get those to the politicians. Uh, if I could just start, uh, Ian Lees Galloway, is Labour still committed to a, a scientific approach to legal highs via the regulation provided uh, under the Psychoactive Substances Act or will the reactive moves by some uh, councils to ban retailers using bylaws, is that going to shake your resolve at all? No, it doesn't shake our resolve. Um, it's, it's a challenge and it's one that we have to, I find that as I go around the country and if I actually get a chance to sit down with councillors and talk them through what the select committee's thinking was, what, what parliament's thinking was, then you, you actually start to get, you, know, you start to see eye to eye quite quickly. Um, and that was the problem, that local government didn't get the opportunity to participate in the development of the legislation. So they felt left out. They then got given this um, job of regulating within their own uh, areas and, and sort of said, well, where, where on earth did this come from? Mm. Um, and, and how are we supposed to deal with our ratepayers saying we want them banned? So um, it, it is that, that just is, is proof that you know, democracy has to be done properly and, and you actually have to consult with everybody who's being affected. Um, we, we absolutely support the scientific approach. Uh, but as I said, we think there are other components that have to go around that legislation to make sure that it works properly. And what are some of those components? Um, well, one thing is I've put a, a member's bill into the ballot. It's a tiny thing, but that's the nature of, of member's bills, unfortunately, to give the Health Promotion Agency the ability to work in with psychoactives. At the moment, um, they're very tightly mandated on what they can do. Most of their work is, is focused on alcohol. Uh, and so what, what it would do is it would give the Health Promotion Agency both the mandate to do research, to provide education. I heard Annette talk about education. Uh, you know, so these are the guys who are behind the ghost chips ad and the no more beersies for you ad. So these, these, these folks are good at providing education and uh, harm reduction information in a way that is easily consumed by the people it's targeted at. And so if they were working in psychoactives, they would be actually providing, they'd be able to support the effort to provide the information that, that people who are potentially going to use psychoactives uh, need to, to use them in, in a, a low-risk, low-harm low fashion. Um, the other thing I would do for all the importers, manufacturers and retailers in the room is uh, charge a levy against, uh, against the importers, the re retailers and manufacturers to fund the Health Promotion Agency. It's exactly what we do with alcohol. It's a, it's a good system that works well, and I see no reason why we should shouldn't use it uh, on psychoactives as well. Uh, just a uh, fi final question. The structure of the, uh, of the Act, the safeguards, do you think that alcohol or tobacco would be able to pass the very stringent levels that you've set for them? Uh, I think they would struggle. Um, and there will always be a special place in our hearts for alcohol and tobacco. <laughs> and, um, you know, I just, I just think, you know, th those... Uh, whilst I agree with Kevin, we need a more coherent model than what we have at the moment. I mean, we, we have low-risk substances that are illegal, and we've got low-risk substances that are legal, and we've got high-risk substances that are legal, and we've got high-risk substances that are illegal, and if that sounds confusing, it's because it is. Um, we do need more, a more coherent approach, but the fact is um, that uh, alcohol and tobacco, I suppose, um, will, you know, that ship has sailed, and uh, I guess with um, psychoactive substances and with the prohibited drugs, we have an opportunity to do it way, way better than we did with alcohol and tobacco. Uh, Kevin, we seem to have uh, a media in New Zealand that's simply too immature to discuss cannabis policy like adults. Is this why the Greens seem reluctant to push for reform? I mean, how, how serious would the Greens be in government to, to push for more reform on drugs? Well, of, of course, I would never criticise the news media, um, Bomber. <laughs> That's my yes, job. Is that clear? Yes. Um, uh, uh, I'm always bemused by this, by this uh, bemused and frustrated by, by, the, by that conversation, which I have a lot, I have to say, on Facebook. Um, and, uh, and principally from, from people who think that the way to get reform is for the Green Party to make a lot of noise about the issue. Well, you know, if I have, if I have any specialisation, it is in the area of political strategy. 
and uh, making a lot of noise about an issue occasionally is precisely the right thing to do. Um, but very often it's not the right thing to do. Uh, and so what I think is most important is actually figuring out the strategy that will get us to the point that we need to be at. And so the, those issues that I spoke about, uh, the, the use of the Psychoactive Substances Act as the kind of platform for developing this framework I'm talking about, mm. uh, getting all of the uh, law reform organisations on the same page, uh, I can't, can't stress how Im enough how important that is because if we have multiple different organisations and they're all actually saying somewhat different things, that makes it very easy for reluctant governments to do nothing mm. because they can, they can say, well, you're telling me this is the most important thing, but I had organisation X in my office just, just yesterday saying I needed to do something different. So actually, figuring out the strategy that will achieve the law reform, that is the most important thing. And if, uh, if, if when we work out the strategy that will work, um, very high profile advocacy is going to be an important part of that strategy, mm. that's what we'll do. Mm. Um, but so what, I, what I'm saying is horses for courses, and right now we are engaged in the things that we know will actually make positive progress towards the kind of law reform we're, that we're talking about. How much of a bottom line is it for the Greens in coalition with uh, Ian over here? I mean, are you going to push it hard to have drug reform? Uh, will Labour be uh, open to that? Or is it something that will just drop off the, the ledger when you have to actually start governing? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, we, we don't know is the, is the, the honest and, and brief answer. Um, we did not go into the uh, last election with any bottom lines at all, mm. none at all. Um, so, uh, as it turned out, we also didn't go into any negotiation with <laughs> potential <laughs> government partners. But it, that's going to be different this time, and both both Ian and, and Annette are going to be around the table with us, I'm sure. Um, but our, our basic policy, uh, basic approach is, okay, let's look to find the areas of common ground uh, and build on those. Um, there will be issues that we want to talk about first, um, and those will be uh, the ones that we campaign on. Mm. Um, and, and most vigorously, and last time it was Jobs, Rivers, Kids. Uh, many of you will remember the ads. Um, it's likely to be something similar again this, this time around. So those are the things we'll be talking about first, but then after that, we are keen to explore all of the areas where we can find common ground with our potential coalition partners. That sounds like is going to include this. Um, medicinal cannabis, finally, medicinal cannabis or full decriminalisation, what do you think is most likely? Uh, there was a real chance uh, for medicinal cannabis that only sh uh, missed out by a short amount of votes. Is that something that you would see as a more, uh, more doable uh, process than full decriminalisation? I think it's actually quite hard to read um, the, because I think the, the in, in many places around the world the medicinal cannabis debate has effectively been a proxy um, for, for decrim or legalisation. Um, and I think what has, what has changed in the last year is, is that the, the landscape for, for proper drug law reform actually is now really taking shape very quickly. Mm. So I would have said definitely medicinal, you know, easier yeah. to achieve um, earlier on. Actually, I'm not sure now. But we do have a, an opportunity to test that. So there is a, a petition at the Health Select Committee from William Ray, who's, who's, who's here today, good on William, um, around implementing the Law Commission's recommendations on medicinal cannabis. Um, and uh, so we, we will get an opportunity to see where, how far the other parties are prepared to push that issue. Right. Uh, Annette, uh, finally to you. According, I just want to touch on something that you um, said in your opening speech. According to Just Speak, uh, the proportion of young Māori being caught with drugs uh, that leads on to a prosecution has doubled between 94 and 2011. Has drug policy failed Māori? 
I think the criminal justice system's failed Māori and drug, the drug policy is a, a fundamental um, foundation of that. Incarceration rates since 1980 have doubled. At any muster level in any, uh, in throughout our prison system at the moment, there's 8,000 to 8,800 people. When I started in law, there was never more than 4,000 to 4,400 people. So in the time that I've been practicing as a lawyer, um, we've doubled the prison numbers. We've uh, created privatization of, privers, uh, of, of prisons, and the war on drugs has filled those prison beds. So the reality for us in Mana is that economic apartheid and justice is linked to that fact, and we must find a total approach that minimizes that, and that is why we are guided by the health first issues that the Law Commission have identified, but much, much more fundamentally must be linked to a wider criminal justice um, strategy that does not discriminate against Māori and Pacific Island. Uh, I think I'll open it up to the floor. Uh, question over here. Thanks. Um, I'm Richard Good, the Vice President of the Aotearoa Legalised Cannabis Party. I should probably be, be up on the stage on the empty seat, but um, we're not in Parliament yet, so I'll content myself with a uh, question from the floor. And the question is, um, and Kevin has already touched on this, but why are we so far behind the rest of the world on the medical cannabis issue, and what are you going to do about it? Because, you know, I'm, I'm happy to wait a few years until I can legally smoke cannabis, and I've got AB Fubinaka and PB22 in the interim, but there are patients out there who need their medicine and they can't legally get it and I think we should do something about this urgently. So what are you going to do? I think, I think the answer to why, why are we so far behind is because for some reason in, well, for in New Zealand, as it has been elsewhere, it's been seen as a proxy for decriminalisation or legalisation. Um, and uh, we, you know, we often hear at the Select Committee from the Ministry of Health, well, uh, the government has no plans to legalise the recreational use of cannabis, so uh, we don't want to go anywhere near medicinal cannabis. Meanwhile, meanwhile, of course, we have medicinal use of opiates, and there's no plan to, you know, legalise the, re um, the recreational use of opiates either. Uh, and and so it's it's yeah, we we get these arguments that just actually don't make any sense. Um, and I and I suppose over the years there just been has been a nervousness from politicians uh, to uh, do anything that looks like liberalisation. If we could do a better job of separating the issue of recreational and medicinal use and actually pursue medicinal use for, for that purpose, not as a proxy for recreational use, then I think we would get a lot further. Kevin, is, is, it, is, it, is it right that, that cancer sufferers and, and, and people with AIDS or terminal illness are seen by the system as criminals? if they use medicinal cannabis. Is that really something we want in New Zealand? Uh, no, no, it's not. <laughs> we, think, uh, we think medicinal cannabis ought to be available. We had a bill that we put to the parliament in 2009 uh, to achieve that, and we didn't have the numbers. Uh, at this point, we still don't have the numbers. Um, so at this point, it's Sativex. Um, uh, and set of X that you will pay for yourself um, because because there is no subsidy on it. Uh, so one of the one of the areas we're looking at is is it possible to uh, to bring in a, a subsidy on set of X at that so as a as a an interim step. But I mean fundamentally the reform doesn't you know doesn't come until we can command a majority in the house, and we can't yet. Uh, Annette is, is one of the reasons why we haven't made any moves on this because mainly the people who are falling victim uh, criminally are Māori and Pacific Island. They don't have the voice, do they? Yeah, I think th it's a combination of factors. My colleagues here have, I think, identified the key. But um, the disenfranchised don't vote. And uh, Paul Quinn, when he was in for the National Party, refused the ability for jailed prisoners to vote. Mm. That would have been a good 8,800 votes, my electorate for me, I know, um, <laughs> you know, but that's the reality, is that those that are most impacted upon have actually been discriminated against in t human rights terms. So I wouldn't say it's been a targ targeted racist policy, but the consequences of it has been seen disenfranchisement of those that 
would seek both medicinal marijuana legislated for and recreational use dealt with in an appropriate way. Most users that I contact with every day uh, see health issues arising from overuse. Um, most of them don't get release conditions from jail to deal with those problems unless there's a special requirement at the parole board. Most of them don't advocate for themselves in it, so it's a vicious circle for them if they do have drug problems. Uh, if you are watching this at home and you want to send through questions, hashtag pathway to reform. Uh, more from the floor. Oh, question over here from the, uh, off the net. No. <laughs> questions, hands up, anyone? Any questions, your chance? Right there. Hey, the National Party aren't here for me to ask them this question, so I'll ask you guys. I see the um, psychoactives bill as the result of, you know, the proliferation of synthetic cannabinoids as a result of the prohibition of cannabis. What are the political arguments for maintaining the status quo as it is now, for not regulating, as say Colorado have, with a model which, you know, provides employment at a retail and a, you know, bureaucratic regulation level, enormous tax revenue? What are the, what are their arguments exactly? I haven't really been able to come across any that... Have, have any of you, basis. I mean, Judith's obviously pretty busy, Judith Collins having late night secret dinners with people, but um, beyond that, has she actually come up with any reason why? Oh. I, guess, I, I guess it's a belief that prohibition reduces harm. Yeah? And, and yeah, we, could, we could unpick that argument until <laughs> the cows come home, I'm sure. Maybe the cows with milk. Uh, Judith would be keen on milk. Um, but... Um, <laughs> We, no, I didn't mean to do that, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I suppose it, what's also useful about prohibition, and if, I, and if I may, I'm sorry, use your question to go off on a tangent. What's useful about prohibition is it, is it sweeps the problem under the carpet. You know, we can't see how many people are using drugs, whether they're using drugs responsibly or whether they've got an addiction or they've got a problem or there are social um, issues that go with their drug use. We just can't see it. And that's kind of comfortable because we don't have to worry about it then. Mm. One of the interesting things about uh, what's happened since the um, Psychoactive Substances Act has come into force is that we've, um, because we've reduced the number of outlets, we can now really see how much drug use is going on in our communities. And a lot of people have replaced natural cannabis with synthetic cannabis they're at more risk as a result, which is interesting. Um, but, um, but we can see it. And so that's kind of a double-edged sword. On one hand, a lot of people see it as something that's really ugly because they, they see a lot of social problems going with it. Um, but the other thing is we can now actually respond to the problems associated with drug misuse and drug abuse because we can actually see it happening and we can see the extent of it. Prohibition is very comfortable because um, we can just pretend there is no problem. And, the, and by bringing the problem out into the open, we now have to decide what we do about it. And, and that's a challenge for politicians. Could I just say one thing as well? The, um, you'd like to think probably that, that politicians uh, will form policy on the basis of kind of rational analysis. Um, and, and, it, <laughs> and 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 an ob objective uh, op opinion about what they think to be in the best interest of the country. Um, of course, that's what the Green Party does. <laughs> but for some other parties, I mean, uh, so if you think about, I mean, every single National Party MP voted against our Med Pot Bill. Um, so why did they do that? It's because their, their approach to politics is instead to say, what, what do our voters and the, and the voters who currently don't vote for us but might, what do they think about this issue? So, so they're, they're looking not at sort of, not at rational analysis, not at New Zealanders' opinions, but the opinions of a particular group in society. And the, I guess the, the sort of war on drugs rhetoric 
has, I mean, that's been pretty deeply ingrained for, for quite some time. Um, so it's not surprising that there is a constituency for a politics based on, based on that rhetoric. And that's what we see. Annette? Mm, I'd like to second guess the National Party, but it's a, a nightmare to even go there. Um, can I say that prohibition is driven quite often um, as a mother of children by fear? And my fear is that we sometimes impose adult policies without good consideration of what those policies may be for those that have yet to form informed outcomes and judgments. So I think at the end of the day, some of the politicians I've spoken to, when you ask them, they, that's their biggest concern, is that we're going to uh, increase the suicide rate amongst young men and women that if we don't, if we have um, carte blanche open access to um, whether it's legal highs or um, marijuana, that's going to have social ills that we are ill prepared for. And I think that's why for us in mana, education and health prevention is the answer, not fear. And to achieve that, it requires our young people having this available to them as part of a civic responsibility education program in schools. Question over there. Uh, <coughs> I guess this question is directed to the two gentlemen on the panel because uh, we have Greens and uh, Labor Party in Australia. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, your party represented Yeah, But uh, can I just ask, uh, if Australia was going down the same road as New Zealand, you know, the uh, mechanics of uh, gravity and, you know, all that sort of stuff would probably come into effect and it would be a lot easier for both countries. Now, can I just ask you two guys, do you... Uh, lobby your counterparts in Australia, in the Greens and Labor, to run down the same road? Because we have struck a brick wall in both Greens and Labor in Australia on this issue. Uh, well, spe speaking for the Greens, um, we, we have some level of interaction with, with the Aussie Greens, but uh, it's, it's, it's a bit tricky because uh, of your strange political system. Um, so it's like the Aussie Greens are not one organisation. Like there's the federal Greens and there's the Greens in each of the each of the states and territories, um, and uh, so there there tend to be individuals over there, like Bob Brown, for example, um, Adam Bent, uh, Scott Ludlam. You know that we do have good relationships with, but they tend to be personal relationships rather than um, a sort of trans Tasman political alliances. Um, we have a desire to have a, a better political relationship with them, um, but uh, so far uh, that desire, as with many of our other desires, remains unrequited. Uh, well, we, we are in good contact with the Australian Labor Party. Um, I, I can't I have to say I have never had a conversation uh, with my counterpart about uh, what they should be doing about drug law reform. Um, but as Kevin was talking, it, it occurred to me that we have made a lot of progress on a joint regulator of uh, medicinal drugs and, uh, and so-called um, natural products. Um, maybe we could be thinking about how we could apply that uh, joint regulation approach to uh, recreational substances as well. And Annette. We could we could talk about it. Annette, <laughs> this, that's, that's me making up policy whilst I'm sitting in front of you. So <laughs> naughty, it's very naughty. <laughs> Annette, um, does Mana have much connection with uh, Aboriginal groups within Australia? I know Hone, of course, went over there uh, and, and toured some of the open air prisons. Um, are there are there connections there about the same issues? Yeah, I don't think we've ever responded to government initiatives for health prevention. Um, indigenous communities are developing our own strategies, and I'm proud to say, as Mana, um, I've been working with uh, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islanders, and a number of communities to look at ways that um, the impacts of the war on drugs can um, minimise in, um, the way that communities function. And we regularly meet with a number of uh, Aboriginal leaders to look at strategies that may be imposed in the Pacific. We're not in favour of the ANSPA the therapeutic approach uh, because we see uh, a fundamental question is whose knowledge is getting stolen and commodified through those processes. 
and uh, we've been more with the um, local uh, shop person who deals with locally produced product here and trying to prevent that joint regulatory approach that says indigenous communities. We're not opposed to it, but the danger of it is, is that that tia takes away our tinoranga tiratanga or the right to self-determine our own house priorities. Uh, next question from the floor. Next question, hands up. Right here. Thank you. Uh, look, just interested in the question of tax and um, I guess the size of the market. Uh, just as a little aside, I visited a couple of the shops last night and asked a couple of the customers, uh, uh, you know, why this and, and, and not cannabis or, or some grass? And they said, well, one guy said, look, I'm a you know, regular smoker, I'm basically addicted and I can't score tonight. Uh, so there's a substitute product clearly between the cannabinoids, and I note the question before how uh, irrational it is to have an analog a substitute cannabis while cannabis is illegal. I mean, it makes no sense, and I imagine the future will be a um, uh, you know if the legislation is acceptable and pursued, uh, cannabis, will, cannabis will come under that same um, uh, psychoactive uh, drugs. I mean, it must in any logical extension, or else the, the, the pendulum will swing the other way, and this legislation will be. Um, uh, retracted or repealed, which of course is uh, the, the fear, which is why I guess a lot of people are here to give it give it some uh, some credence. Uh, the question again comes down to dollars and cents, though. Whether it's a substitute product, we know the marijuana market is 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 a hundreds of millions of dollar market in in, in New Zealand, a, a, a billion dollar market in Australia. The tax revenues run into potential tax revenues run into the billions, and perhaps again politically speaking, and I was interested to hear that you know yeah. I hate to be but the same old thing, we're going to mass up, you know, we, we, we're, we're politically animals here and we know how far we can go and similar to the, the comments Fiona said of the situation in Australia, that politicians will push the envelope so far but for their own political uh, survival will only go so far. Um, I guess the point I'm leading to is that, 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 that dollars and cents, money in the, uh, the pockets to pay for, you know, not just rehabilitations but, but Bottom line, schools, education, services for the Indigenous people that are, are suffering uh, under the, these policies. Um, is the market quantified? Is there an argument that uh, can be put by politicians to the public as leaders, which is what we look to our politicians for, to put the argument that he's, he's billions of dollars that, that could be spent for the welfare, the good uh, of mankind? I'll answer it. The conundrum for us in mana is that the tool of the coloniser was alcohol and um, tobacco came in with that promise of tax for our benefit in 150 years has not proven that for us. Um, secondly, where revenue is gained, it's not um, self-determined in its prioritisation by Indigenous communities. Quite often we become add-on providers or the afterthought. Um, so um, any um, taxation benefit to us needs to be clearly, um, I think, thought through. And for us, the war on the poor is our priority, and that's the fundamental reality in this country, that there is this huge economic apartheid that exists, and I'm not too sure if the tax on marijuana or any substitute substance is going to deal with that in a fundamental way. We uh, had a bit of a conversation at the Select Committee about whether or not we would whether it was desirable to introduce an excise tax on the synthetic products which are regulated by the Psychoactive Substances Act. The advice that we got from the Ministry of Health was that because we usually use an excise tax simply to, to push up price as a, as a harm reduction tool, if we, if we consider the way we've used it with alcohol and with tobacco, um, that as a, as a harm reduction tool that we'd be better off uh, seeing what the market looked like, seeing what the pre what the pricing points were, <coughs> and within the within the act there is a, a requirement that we do a review after five years, and and I think that the sort of the view amongst the bureaucrats is that the five year point would be the time to look at what we should do with an excise tax, um, and we bought that argument at the time as we were speeding through this legislation at at breakneck speed, um, and it's one of the things I think we got wrong. I think we should have put an excise tax on psychoactives, and thank you. Um, and if we, and if anything else, 
ever falls under the, the Psychoactive Substances Act, then I think an excise tax should be applied to that as well. And, um, and likewise, as we have with alcohol, as I mentioned, um, you know, we can apply levies for things like the Health Promotion Agency that, that are hypothecated into the health system and used for education and harm reduction. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, we support a tax. Um, the, uh, 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 in terms of adding something to the conversation uh, th that that's already taken place about this issue, um, there's there's an active conversation in New Zealand at the moment about um, uh, ta taxes on uh, sugar sweetened beverages, sugary drinks, um, and and potentially on foods as well. And there's a there's a, a world literature about what makes those things successful um, and and what doesn't. And one of one of the things that that uh, is is a necessary thing for public support of such a tax. Um, and I, I fully appreciate that not not these are not entirely parallel situations. But the hypothecation of the tax, so actually using the tax to fund services that clearly establish public good. Um, rather than simply as a source of revenue for for the government as a whole, um, seems to be a crucial element. So, given that we've got a whole lot of alcohol and drug uh, treatment services in this country that clearly do not have the capacity that they need uh, to be able to provide uh, for the needs that people have, um, this seems to me to be a, a possible win-win situation. Um, so, impose the tax. Um, and hypothecate it, use it to to properly fund alcohol and drug treatment services. Um, quick question to all three of you. How much of an impact do you think the welfare reforms in New Zealand, which saw beneficiaries all now drug tested, uh, how much of an impact has that had in the growth of the synthetic cannabis market? Because if people are going to lose their benefit or welfare if they're caught smoking cannabis, they quickly transfer. I mean, is that uh, is that one of the consequences that were unforeseen, or that was a specific consequence? That that was actually something they wanted. <laughs> so I'm holding the microphone. Um, I have no information about this at all. <laughs> my my uh, my guess is that the that there has been a significant effect um, as to whether it was the intention. Or not, I, I I I tend to think it probably wasn't the intention, but they're probably not unhappy about that as a consequence. Right. Well, you ask us what the intended consequence of the policy was. It had nothing to do with making workplaces safer or getting beneficiaries off drugs. It was about getting middle class people to hate on beneficiaries. Yeah. Um, but uh, in terms of unintended consequences, my gut tells me that um, if uh, cannabis and, and other drugs show up in a test and synthetics don't, then the natural consequence of that is that people will move into the things that don't show up on the test. Mm. Um, what I find bizarre is that um, you know, because cannabis can be detected days after it's been used, and you, you, you may you probably aren't under the influence of cannabis when you show up for your job uh, interview or you show up at work, um, but, uh, you know, methamphetamine and, and various other things which everybody considers to be worse alongside psychoactives are all out of your system by the time you show up at work there's an incentive to actually do harder drugs mm. the policy's mm. mad do we need to look at impairment in terms of cannabis rather than just testing for its availability when it comes to those who are being tested for work or for well, I come from Lutudu in the forestry industry where the use of cannabis and um, legal highs is being highly scrutinised by employers. Yeah. Um, um, and there is an um, uh, inappropriate um, distinction between those because the tests discriminate against those that are cannabis users that don't get caught in it. The reality is, though, workers' safety should be paramount and there should have been an education process um, and workers' rights should have been prioritised in that process because most of them are working 14 hours. And that, a lot of these young men have been directed there following the uh, benefit cuts and changes because they are the hard labourers that are being required to um, fell the forests, 
um, long 14, 15 hour days and many of them are using um, drugs just to stay awake. Mm. So um, mm. there has been a much greater consequence and that's the huge loss of life. Mm. Um, 13 young men died in my region last year and I think at least three quarters had some either um, legal high or cannabis element in um, some of the factors being explored as to why those deaths are good. So um, yes, the um, beneficial recuts by um, uh, Paula Benefit and the others need to be really carefully scrutinised and we need much better testing. Getting back to this though, those are the reasons why people scaremonger not to provide solutions and I think they're not to be seen as barriers to a single approach to drug reform that focuses on health as opposed to criminality. Uh, to the floor, question over here. Hi, my name is Warren Skill. I'm a retailer in Invercargill for psychoactive substances. Um, when it first came about selling those products, most of the reasons given to me mainly at the time was they were changing to synthetic cannabis because they couldn't um, do marijuana or cannabis anymore because they would be tested at work. I'd see in the, he touched on it a little bit before the men in the front about um, this issue, but I think it's been left out that they're actually testing for synthetic cannabis as well, and they're testing for old products, but the old products have some of, some of the old products components are in the new products. So a lot of people are being punished for doing now what is a legal product in their own time, not at work. Um, when, when will some proper laws be made up around workplace testing? Now that, now that this is law has come into effect to this new cycle of substances, wouldn't something need to be changed in workplace testing or some kind of framework be put in there? Because at this stage, employ, employers can pretty much um, do what they want within the law, but a lot of them are actually breaking the law. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions from the floor? We got anyone else put their hand up? Let me round, oh, right here, just here. Up here, microphone. There we go. At the front here. Hello, I'm uh, Brian Emerson from Canada, so a little ways away. Had a little opportunity to see how things are starting to unfold. It's very interesting, and I appreciate the comments about local authorities and how, given more time, it could be done differently. Uh, the observation seems to be that some local authorities are using the local policies to actually affect a prohibition within the geography of their communities. And I'm wondering, in terms of going forward, what, what your perspective would be on the ability of local authorities to actually affect a ban in their communities, or is, is there a, a, a way to strike a balance between allowing availability but control and allowing local authority autonomy versus the uh, central authority uh, principles of, of the uh, new psychoactive substances act yeah it's it's interesting the yeah you know, we've heard a lot of councils talking about how they would like to be able to use the local plans to affect a ban and how a lot of their constituents would like them to do that uh, but we've yet to see a council come up with an effective ban with a, with the exception of of Hamilton that hasn't that doesn't plan to ban them in the long term, but has come up with a plan that just bans all the ones that are already there, uh, and then retrospectively applying that, which is which is an interesting um, legal situation that I know some people in the room are pursuing. Uh, councils are aware that the intention of the legislation was not to ban the, the retail of, of psychoactive substances, and I know in my own uh, city, Palmerston North, as we've been. You know, I, obviously I'm not on the council, but I've been submitting and working with people who have made submissions around uh, their local plan. There has always been the view that we have to accept that psychoactive substances need to be available for sale in, in our city. Let's just figure out where we want that to happen, how many, how many outlets we think is, there is, is an appropriate amount, um, and what are the sensitive sites that we don't want them to be sold near, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, and I think, and, and the fear that has been um, articulated by the council is that if they are too restrictive, then the Ministry of Health will essentially ignore their local plan when it comes time for full licenses to be applied for. 
And so I, I actually think the legislation is about right now. It's just that the councils have wanted to use it to go further than it allows them to, but will probably discover as they go through this process that they're not able to. If they are, well, then that's, then, then that's an error on our part and we'd have to go back and have a look at the legislation. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? I think the, uh, the, what we are seeing with some of the councils, particularly some of the smaller local authorities, is effectively a kind of a, a ripple from the from the moral panic that was gripping the country prior to the act, um, and so so a lot of councils are still in, in fact using arguments as if the act didn't exist. Um, so I think that there's a, that's probably a temporary thing, um, and and that uh, while it's frustrating in the short term in the longer term, we'll work through that. Uh, I do have, um, I mean, uh, one of the concerns I have is I, I, I do want councils to be able to uh, restrict the places where retail outlets can be. And my, my uh, where I come from on that is, is that if we, if we uh, put up a map of the country or, or a particular area and, and then mark where the liquor outlets are and the um, gambling outlets are and the fast food outlets are actually, you know, the, what we see is a targeting by industry of com mm -hmm. communities that are, that are poor or marginalised um, and, and I don't think we want to do that. So, so I, I think it is in entirely appropriate for councils to be able to control where, where outlets should be, provided that they do so on a rational basis rather than a moral panic basis. Any? No. I don't think I can add um, one more, but I know from an Indigenous perspective, we've tried to resist this notion of one law for all to enable this flexibility within local communities to be given some force at least to target where these outlets may be regulated, but more importantly, um, programs that facilitate the uh, harm of it being understood. You know, they go hand in hand. But um, we have a dogma in this country inherited from our colonisers, the British law, one law for all. And unfortunately, we haven't adapted our system to enable that measure of flexibility to enable a more different approach which um, I think harnesses the values of health, health and well-being, which a Māori jurisprudence approach may be more akin to than one based on punishment. Any more questions from the? F oh, uh, any more? Any more? No, no. Yep, yep. This question is actually for um, the MPs who aren't here, but um, perhaps you guys can answer it. Um, recently, uh, three or four or five products were um, had the interim product approvals withdrawn because of uh, adverse effects which were phoned into the um, 0800 line. Um, one of those products, I can't remember its name, that was pulled off the shelves um, is identical to a product which is still available for sale. Um, this doesn't engender confidence in uh, what the uh, Ministry of Health is actually um, doing. Um, can you shed any light on this uh, at all? It's not often I'm the most right-wing person in a political panel, so I'll try and speak for the National Party. Um, <laughs> um, look, I, this, is, this is this resourcing issue. So we pass the law, great. So what? Um, we then have to actually make sure the ministry is appropriately resourced to be able to enforce the law properly. And I, I just don't think that half a dozen people uh, in the ministry trying to write the new regulations, do the consultation on the new regulations, issue interim licences, figure out how they're going to issue full licences, and uh, enforce, the, enforce the law and deal with complaints about substances that are potentially causing um, more than a low risk of harm is actually enough. It's so, so passing legislation wasn't the end of the story. 
but government would like to think that, like, like you to think that it was and that everything is fixed. So, um, yeah, I, I think the answer to your question is making sure that the ministry and the other agencies that are involved are appropriately resourced to be able to respond uh, to that kind of situation. And this will just be, that'll be a, a pure oversight. You know, they'll have, they'll have reacted, they'll have had the call in about a particular substance, they'll have said, right, we've got to do something about that, and, and they won't have had the resource to actually go through and, and, and the time to say, hang on, well, what else um, fits the same formula? Well, I mean, there are no fees and levies at the moment, so so if there's any fee or levy, they were going to have to rise. And, and look, I think that's I think that's definitely got to be part of it. Is that um, yeah, the industry does have to kind of pay its way here. It's you know rights and responsibilities. So uh, they have the right to to sell the products, and with that comes the responsibility. Kevin, anything to add? You can't put yourself into a national party headspace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Would you want to? Yeah. Um, let me. We got any more over here? Question. Oh, just a quick point there. The regulatory authority, which has been set up, is funded by licensing fees um, at present. So the um, we pay for a license to retail. You pay hundreds of thousands, I think, for a license to put a product through. So there is there is um, some infrastructure there which we are paying dearly for already. Last question here. Just uh, want to pick up on a colleague of my friend uh, next to me here. I think there might be a bit of confusion about the uh, uh, health surveillance around why that uh, call might have been made on that particular product. The Ministry of Health um, gets monthly reports from uh, the New Zealand Poison Centre and uh, the Pharmacovigilance Centre, and it's on the basis of those monthly reports uh, that um, decisions uh, based on revoking interim licences um, are applied. And it could be that the, even though the product name is the same, there might be like a batch with a different uh, level of um, the active ingredient. And we made a distinction earlier today between um, uh, psychoactive products and substances themselves. So that might be an issue. I, I mean, I having recently spent a fair bit of time looking at the legislation, I'm increasingly impressed with how it's been developed. Exactly and, and, and it, Okay, um, I'm still not convinced that it was just like a straight oversight. I, I, you know, I think and the other thing you have to remember is that this is a process that's evolving. It's incredibly young. It's been in operation eight months. It's an astounding thing, and, and if there are going to be some wrinkles. Um, but hey, big ups to the people that have put it into motion, and um, let's let's continue to to watch. Uh, look, I've got no. I've got no issue with the people who are doing the job. I just wish they had a little bit more help and a little bit more resource. And, and you're right about the fact that it's evolving. Uh, the, um, the, I, I guarantee you there'll be some things taken off the shelf you know, for reasons that, you know, that perhaps don't necessarily stack up on an evidence base. But we had to have that there because we agreed to leave things on the shelf before the approval process was in place. We had to have the ability to take things off the shelf, and I don't know that we could do it much better than, than what we've put in place. Uh, final question to, to, to all three of you. So in terms of drug reform in New Zealand, if you are part of any government by the end of the year, what could we expect? Would we see uh, drug reform as part of a government's legislative lineup, or would we see a private member's bill? Well, what you, would, what you would see from us is, as I said, a full response to the Law Commission report and then a replacement for the Misuse of Drugs Act. But I would want that to be on a first principles basis and on, a, on the principles of um, harm reduction and getting the regulatory system right. I wouldn't want it to be about any one particular substance. Right. So um, I, what, I, what I don't anticipate you seeing from Labor is, is anything that says specifically we will decriminalise or legalise cannabis, we want to look at the drug regulation system a, in total. Kevin? It depends how strong we are in a, in a new government. <laughs> it, did, did you get that code? 
The um, I certainly, I mean, I mean, our viewpoint is, uh, I mean, on, in relation to you, to your question about government measure or private members' bill, me, actually, it's just a members' bill now. Um, we, I mean, we think it should be government that's actually le leading on this. It should be a government bill. We we're not really in favour of conscience votes. We think it should, it's a basic policy issue that um, that government parties need to have policy on. However. If allowing a conscience vote means we get the numbers, I'm all for it. Annette, are these two staunch enough to do it, or is it going to be a, a, a member's bill? Uh, I, th I, th I think that's the backstop, the member's bill. But I also don't want to get bogged down in a legislative process that um, is really a smokescreen of what we should be doing when we actually do nothing. So I think mana would demand at least some incremental outcome before any final review um, occurred. And we would demand that. So, given that the only policy we have is medical, uh, medicinal marijuana at the purpose, that would be a bottom line discussion point, and we would like to know when. Ladies and gentlemen, if the uh, drug reform is up to these three, we are in very, very good hands. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please. Thank you for being brave enough to actually come along and have the mana about yourselves to state your political party's positions, unlike so many other political parties today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Grant, it's all yours.